Hi everyone, it's Maura Gamble here. Welcome to Masterclass number 32 from the Permaculture Education Institute. The topic we're going to be exploring today is lunch from the garden and the many different aspects we can explore about what this means, this simple action, how this can actually contribute to us weaving a new narrative of the world that we live in. So why why eat from your garden? What's the importance of this? It's an incredibly simple act that we can do that helps us to connect with our place, with our community. It helps us to find healthy, nutritious, local foods that we can access affordably. So a local lunch supports an ecological and holistic way of living and enables us to think about how we can feed ourselves with earth care, people care and fair share, the ethics of permaculture. It helps us to really address our own personal health and well-being at the same time as planetary health and well-being. We're able to think about how we can meet our needs without importing foods across the planet or supporting industrial farming systems. So essentially all of these things helps us to be more ecological in the way that we're being in the world. And, you know, most of us don't have the opportunity to grow all of our food or even most of our food in our small urban backyards, possibly. So what growing your own local food does helps you to shift into thinking about well, where does the other stuff come from and then supporting those regenerative food systems that are able to meet the rest of our needs. And what it does, too, is it helps us to think about how we can design our our landscapes, our homes, our communities to be healthy human habitats and food, local food, accessible food surrounding us is a central part of that. So growing our own food and eating a lunch from our garden is what I call climate practivism, a form of practical, positive permaculture activism that helps us through this simple act of growing and eating food locally to respond to the critical global issues that we're facing. And it's also deeply about earth care. So caring for the land in which we dwell, caring for the soil and the soil organisms and supporting the diversity of ecological systems that can flourish in your care. So in this session, what I'm going to do is take you out into my garden and show you how I harvest many of the different sorts of permaculture plants and the different parts of the plants too and then show you how I actually just make it an incredibly simple meal that's informed by what's in my garden at the time. So this is what I call my permaculture lunch and it's very much based on what is local, what's locally adapted to my area, what's particularly perennial. I love the perennial foods because it gives me the chance to grow long-term plants which have deep roots, they hold the soil, they're so far more resilient and robust in, with all different uh, environments and, and conditions that are in this particular area. And also the seasonal foods. So what's seasonal? What's local? What's just growing in and around my garden all the time? And how much diversity can I pack into this meal as possible? So the other thing too is, um, this is what Alice Waters said, that one of the one of the leading voices in uh, the farm to table movement. If you start with good ingredients, you don't need to do too much to them. And this is the key thing. It's like, how can you actually gather just beautiful local ingredients from your garden and just simply put them together as a beautiful, simple meal? So permaculture, I see as a way of helping us to create this forager's garden, this idea that we can just wander into this garden and be able to harvest all different sorts of things from, from roots to shoots to fruits to leaves to all kinds of things, edible flowers. So if you grow a diverse permaculture garden, you don't need to look far for ingredients for your meals. It's all just there around you. And when you wander out and see what's looking great for the day, that just informs what it is that you can grow. You know, I have a few basic recipes in my mind, but essentially I harvest first. And whatever it is that I see in my garden that looks really great for today, that's what then becomes the main uh, element of my meals. So the question is then, what are you drawn to? What is looking really fresh? What is looking uh, ripe and ready? What are the different parts of the plants that you could possibly harvest? 
So I stay away from the things that are either too young or looking a little bit past it or maybe they're a bit bug eaten at the moment. And I tend to the things which are really flourishing because they're the ones that are going to be just make the beautiful meal. Growing a garden lunch is also one of the easiest way to tend towards being zero waste in your household because what comes from your garden can just go back into it by a whole series of different cycles. It all has its own natural wrapping. So this is brilliant. This I absolutely love and supports us to be um, creating a, a circular economy in our own backyard. And what we do in our own backyard then influences what we spend our money on elsewhere and, and influences the way we perceive and the way we think and the way we make decisions when we head out from our gardens too. So, uh, you know, one of the ways that you can process your food scraps, obviously, is through a worm farm. Or perhaps you have chickens and you can give them the scraps or a compost bin or worm towers or trenches There's, uh, like trench compost. There's so many different ways that you can reintegrate any of the food scraps or paper or um, coffee grounds or cotton clothing can go straight back into your garden. And this is this is brilliant. Now, another thing that I really love about having a garden that you feed yourself from, it gives you an enormous sense of freedom and resilience. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, in freedom, it gives you the freedom of of selecting different sorts of plants, of being free from being determined by what um, companies decide that it's that they'd like you to eat. Uh, you can choose uh, what are the ingredients that are necessary to meet your dietary requirements, for example. Um, you're being able to select the seeds that you want to grow your own food. So you're not actually being dependent on a um, corporate seeds, which are hybrid seeds, which you can't save year by year. So this builds in an enormous amount of resilience as well, because you can take cuttings from plants, you can collect seeds from the plants, you can hand them around. There's a whole lot of um, inbuilt gift economy in this which we've noticed particularly due the, during the pandemic with so many people diving into backyard gardening that this has been a central part of building that sense of resilience but not just for your own self it's not just self sufficiency it's actually community r resilience and this is important but the freedom part of it too is also about having food sovereignty that ability to choose what is culturally appropriate and ethically appropriate and um, ecologically appropriate uh, to be consuming. So I think one of the things that is really important um, is focusing on the seed. So I love to be able to save seeds year after year, but also use my garden as a seed bank. I remember Jude and Michelle Fanton teaching me this, gosh, when I was back in my 20s, about the best the best seed bank is your garden. So what I've done is I've focused on really trying to build up the soil as much as I can so and then allow things when they're seeding to actually just drop a number of seeds into the garden and then they will come back again. I haven't planted mustard spinaches for well over a decade. I haven't planted pumpkins or tomatoes or all of these kind of plants for such a long time but yet they're always there coming up in the garden when it's when the season is right. The seeds are there lying dormant, waiting for the conditions that are suitable for it. And the fact that the soil is, is there with the potential for them to grow healthily, um, all they need is the right season, the right moisture, and pff, off they go. It's just fantastic. So the, having good quality seeds to start with and um, encouraging self-seeding, a self-seeding garden is really central to building in that resilience and that freedom. So a permaculture garden lunch is also affordable gourmet. I mean, the incredible things that you can grow and the, and the things that you can add into each of your foods from the edible flowers to the beautiful flavors of all kinds of herbs and fresh, beautiful orange eggs and multiple colors of greens and purple leaves and things that you just wouldn't be able to buy as an everyday kind of food. It would be so expensive. So I love this about the garden, giving us the chance to actually eat beautiful, healthy, amazing, diverse food every day. And so this is what I'm going to show you how what we're making. This is my simple go-to meal. And also 
We're going to explore um, making a cup of tea to go with that from the garden. So what I've made is a lemon myrtle tea. And also I think that another really important part of creating a backyard garden is thinking about how you can design this space to be an, a friendly space for wildlife. What is the wildlife that you can encourage into your garden? What are the kind of the birds or the the little um, lizards and frogs and all things, bees that you need in your garden to have the ecological integrity? So, so my garden is as much about it being a habitat for other species as it is a place for me. And, you know, there's really nothing more enjoyable than being in your garden and just watching the life and diversity around you and and meeting and greeting animals like this every day you know beautiful king parrots or uh, monitor lizards or green tree frogs and discovering all kinds of amazing wildlife visiting your garden i have migratory birds now that come to my garden and i know when they when they come i hear them arrive and and then they're busy there for a few weeks and then they're off again. But, you know, this is one of the most wonderful joys of being part of this ecological system. And you kind of really realise then how we are just a part of the ecosystem. So let me take you out into the garden now and we'll go harvesting for this lunch. One of the plants in my garden that I really love as something to get a permaculture garden started and also to continue to bring abundance is canna edulis and I just wanted to share with you the many different uses of canna in your garden so you can see this one here it's it's quite it gets quite tall it's way taller than me and this amazing amount of biomass that gets created really rapidly is something you can use as your own mulch so you can add it um, as just a chop and drop mulch you can add it into compost uh, and you can also add it into the chickens as part of their mulch underneath so i use it all the time for that i also find it's really helpful because it grows up quickly in the summertime which then provides a little bit of shade in the garden particularly for the more sensitive type of things but it's not just used as a as a sort of a functional plant it's also an edible plant now actually all, all parts of it are edible, but the older the leaves get and the older the roots get, they're more fibrous. So I always look for the young roots down here and the young leaves. So you can eat these young shoots like this. So you can snip that off and, and take that into the kitchen. Uh, you can do chop and drop with the, with the leaves there. And then what you want to do, you come down here and look closely. So where you've got shoots that are coming out of the roots uh, from below like this, that means they're kind of old. They're going to be fibrous. This one here is just starting. It's probably okay, but what I'm actually looking for is this. See this one here? It's just coming up as a little shoot. I'm going to pull back all the mulch and then underneath. Oh, my gosh, look at that. Here we go. You can kind of see. Oh, my gosh, that's beautiful. <laughs> now here we go. Now that's what I'm looking for. Now that is my tropical potato. So it's what we call Queensland arrowroot canna edulis, and it's this swollen base, the rhizome of this plant, canna edulis, which is what we can use for anything like cooking up your wood a potato. You can slice it, make chips out of it. You can make mashed potatoes. You can add it into soups to thicken it up. You can do anything that you would use a potato for. So you can see here, I know you can see, there's, these are the new ones coming out. And there's another one coming there so i'll leave that to continue on and what you look for is around the edges all the ones that are starting to shoot out and by harvesting these you're actually helping to maintain the clump of this plant here too so i'm going to take that inside and use that as as um as part of my lunch if you weren't just about to go and make lunch you could actually take this and plant it somewhere and get a new plant as well so uh you'll see here there's a little bulb sticking out here that's where a new shoot's going to come out and very rapidly you'll get your own clump so i really recommend if you're living in a warmer climate to integrate canna edulis into your garden so let's go and have a look at some of the other plants we can harvest one of the things i really like to get are lots of the little snips of the pumpkin shoots and leaves that particularly the ones that are dangling off the edge of my wall and then there's this beautiful Suriname spinach, a perennial, really abundant. 
and the Lagos spinach, which is an annual self-seeding plant, which beautiful colour and really abundant too. And, and the weed, the amaranth weed, that's fantastic food. And I love the flavour of the Vietnamese mint, uh, kind of like a coriander alternative. And of course the garlic chive, the flowers, but also big handfuls of the leaves. And I really love to include chilli in just about all my meals. This one here is a particularly mild one, so it's great in so many different things. It's good for the kids too. And of course parsley, great for everything. So thanks to my chickens, I have a regular source of protein and also they do such a fantastic job at helping me to process food scraps and create manure and, and uh, help in the, in the weed management of the garden. So a small flock of chickens is such a useful part of any kind of permaculture garden and central to having a really good lunch. I think actually going and hanging out with the chickens is one of my most favourite parts of the day. And just above the chickens, there's a food forest and there at the moment, there is an absolute abundance of limes. So to go with the lunch, we need a, a tea and there's so many different teas in the garden. One of the ones I've got really close to the house is this. This is lemon myrtle, an, an amazing scent. And all you need for tea is just a little, a few leaves off the end and uh, that will be enough for a few cups. If you're wanting to have a, a big luncheon, you know, maybe two leaves per person. So this would have to be one of my simplest and easiest quick lunches that I just love to go and gather from the garden. Now, at the moment, I'm so lucky because it's pumpkin time. I've got heaps of pumpkin going on out in the garden that's all just kind of wild seeded. And I came home from being away and I just found these beautiful, enormous pumpkins um, all throughout the garden. So I'm going to use the pumpkin. Um, we've got the, the eggs from the chickens. So that's going to be a key part of it. Um, some limes. So the limes are really great as part of the drink, but also as a salad dressing. And then lots of different sorts of greens and purples and foraged weeds and, and all kinds of things, herbs, some chilies um, that can be used as part of the frittata as well. So that's what we're doing. We're going to create a frittata from what we've got here. So the first thing to do is to, to start to prepare the pumpkin and the leafy greens. And so what I do is I'm just going to um, chop them up and then just gently cook them in the pan first. So let's go and do that. So first things first is to get some pumpkin happening. So there we go. Look at that. Oh my gosh, that is beautiful. Okay, so I'm just going to take a little slice for now and put the rest aside. Now, when I'm making a, a frittata, you can put all of that in. There's no reason to peel it. There's no reason to scoop out this. So all I simply do is just finely slice it. So it cooks really quickly. That's kind of the key. You don't want to have to be taking ages with preparing this. So keeping the skins on and everything, just nice fine slices. So that's getting a bit thick there. I might slice that there. There's something really nice about slicing freshly harvested vegetables. There's a different texture to them and a different smell and of course a different flavour and of course much more nutrient density. Okay, so pumpkin done. I'm going to put that on a plate and then I'll get the next thing happening. Box them on the floor. That's okay. I'll give that to the chickens later. All right, so now let's have a look at what greens we got. So in my basket, uh, I collected all different sorts of greens. So let's see. So you're probably familiar with this one, parsley. That's going to go in a bit of the salad on the side. Uh, we've got also garlic chives. So that's just, I always just check to see whether I've picked up a piece of grass with that or there's a, there's a bit that we don't want to eat, like the old bits, just pull those out. So that one's good. Uh, let's see what else we've got. Hmm. 
Wild Amaranth, that one's good as a cooked green. Cranberry Hibiscus, that's a really nice cooked green as well. The tops of a Yacon plant, so we can chop that up as a cooked green. And we have this beautiful Okinawan spinach, which has the purple back and the green front. So we can use that as a, as a fresh green on the side. What else have we got here? Um, Suriname spinach, which has lovely soft leaves. Now, if you're okay with a little bit of oxalic acid, that's okay to have as a, as a raw. But if you're sensitive to that and you know that you are, then put it in the cooked green. So I'm, I'm gonna put it over here. Now we've got Lagos spinach. So I tend to put this in the cooked green and even if it's got some flowers in there, I just chop all that up and put that in too. Oh, um, the garlic chive flower heads. So I put that in the salad. Now this is the leaf off the edible canna, one of the young new leaves, very soft and supple. So I'm gonna cook that up as part of the leafy greens as well. Chilies, well, we can pop them. Well, they're kind of, they're not really full chilies, are they? They kind of cross between chilies and capsicum. So that's gonna go into my, into my salad. And I have another one here, a green one that can go into the cooking. Uh, more Suriname spinach, pop here. Aha, uh -huh, now. This is the um, pumpkin shoots. So the pumpkin tips, the pumpkin leaves. We've got some more young pumpkin leaves. You can feel it's a little bit prickly, so you wouldn't really want to eat it raw, but as a cooked green, after a few minutes, all of those prickles have gone. So I've got that. Um, ah, Vietnamese mint. Now, this is something that's kind of one of those contentious things. If you like coriander, then you can include this. If you don't, maybe just leave it aside. So I like to actually take some of those and some leaves and pop them into the salad and some uh, can go into the cooking as well. And what else have I got here? Aha, uh -huh. the canna edulis. So I'm gonna to need to give these a bit of a wash. A wash. Uh, and my lemon myrtle tea. So I'm gonna make that into a, a tea into my, uh, to go with my, with my lunch. So that's that. Uh, so firstly, we're gonna start by um, getting the vegetables uh, softened and that while we're doing that I can be preparing the egg mix to, to pour on the top so we'll get started on that. So I've just rinsed them off. Now the thing is this has come out of my own organic garden. I know there's no chemicals on it whatsoever so it's I'm not worried about that. Now the other thing too is that um, I, if there's a little bit of dirt on it it actually still doesn't matter. I get most of it off. I'm just going to slice off the roots and this sort of dirty-ish bit on the end there. There we go. And maybe peel off that bit. I'm going to leave the rest of this on and not peel it because what happens when it's cooked, that will actually just slip off really easily. And I can still use that and chop that up as a vegetable. Uh, so I'll just clean that one off too. Pop those in the compost. So any scraps that come off this uh, will actually go straight into the compost. Beautiful. Now the thing you might have noticed that with the pumpkin, there was no food waste because all of the insides and the outsides have all gone into this mix. So the whole idea is actually to try and see if we can just harvest things straight from the garden. It's like zero, zero miles, zero waste. And if there's anything, little bits of scraps like this can go into the compost or go to the chickens and it actually is not a waste then because it's getting cycled back in to improve the soil so that all this will grow even better. All right, so next thing is to, I'm just gonna put the salad aside. Let's yeah. just clean that off. Okay, so with the Vietnamese spinach, I just take the leaves off like that. Uh, with, the, uh, with the pumpkin, I'll just leave that like that. That's absolutely fine. Maybe just take the leaves off and toss away any sort of hard, hard a bit of stem. Um, that looks all okay, but what I might do is just de-rib that section. So take the rib out, there we go, and the rest should be fine. Now what you notice, I'm just putting it all in one big pile. Maybe I'll put it there, and because I'm gonna roll it up and slice it. Uh, with the yacon, so I don't want the stem section, so I'm just gonna take the end bits here. And if it feels like it's too hard in the middle, maybe take out that, take out a bit of the stem as well. There we are, pop that in. Uh, same with the, the Lagos spinach. Spinach, what I do is just strip the leaves off and then take the soft tip. 
Uh, same with the cranberry hibiscus. Just take the leaves. We don't need the stem. That's a bit hard. Uh, so we get lots of different colours and flavours. Now, this is the weed, the, the amaranth. So what you can do, like you can actually take these seeds and eat those as well. That's extra protein. And then you take the leaves and pop that in. The nice ones. The rest can just go in the compost. Beautiful. Uh, and uh, actually, I'll deal with that in a minute. So what I'm going to do is just kind of roll that all up into a nice little uh, sausage here and just start to slice it all up nice and finely. And then maybe just across a couple of times just to make it nice and fine. There we are. Perfect. So what I'm going to do is um, get my pan happening so I can start to get this cooked while we get the egg mixture ready. So to make a frittata, I love to use these sort of cast iron pans because what it means is I can get the vegetables ready here on the top and then when I mix in the eggs, cook the bottom and then stick it in the oven straight away so that it then uh, cooks on top. And the other thing I've done just recently is actually changed to this electric cooktop, uh, the induction cooktop, because it means that I can be running my cooking system entirely off my solar system. And then, and the other thing I like about these pans too is that they're actually guaranteed for many lifetimes that they'll never break and that they're naturally non-stick so you don't have all that false non-stick stuff that comes off, which is really no good for you. So I'm just going to turn on the oven and on the stove. So I'm going to put it up on high and just going to put a little bit of uh, coconut oil or whatever oil it is that you like to use. Um, I like to use something that's either a fair trade or a local type of oil. So I'm just going to let that heat up a bit. Now what I'm going to do is put into this just some of the, the pumpkin. So it's going to cook up quite quickly and um, Let's put a, I'm not going to put all of it into this, I don't think. I'll just put a few bits in like that. There we go. And then also toss in the the, um, the chilli that I chopped up. And then also I'm just going to pop the greens in at this stage on the top too. And then I can walk away and leave that just cooked by itself with the lid on so it starts to almost like steam in its own juices. Every now and then I'll come back and give it a stir and that would be great. So that's that's done, that's easy. So the next thing is to get the egg material ready uh, and also uh, cook up the canna. So we, let's go and do that. So while that's cooking over there, I'm just gonna get the canna ready and mix up the eggy mixture too. So all we need to do with this is just chop it into little chunks like I said before, you can leave the skin on and we can leave those sections. Oh, it's even come off like that, so that's super easy. To make it cook even quicker, we can just uh, slice it in half and we'll get the other one. So we can have this as a side dish. Whoops, run, <laughs> run away, can I? Uh, there we go. And slice up. Now what I'm going to do is pop that into a pot and... Uh, put some water in and just cook that up while the rest is cooking. There we are. So I'll just pop some water in that. So I can pop my kitchen scraps straight out. I always like to have like a little handy compost carry. So I just pop that in here and when it's full I'm going to take it out into my compost bin or into the worm farm and that's that. So keep that nice and handy in the kitchen. Now all that's left to do, so the, the vegetables are cooking, the canna is just softening, um, is to mix up my eggy mix and that way as soon as the vegetables are ready I can just pour this on top and then stick it into the oven. So for, for about, I generally have about one egg per person. That seems to work just fine. those in the compost as well. Now the only other thing I need for this is either some some milk or something like a soft cheese is rather nice. I mean you don't have to, you can just mix the egg and put that on too but Evan was out milking this morning so we're part of this um, 
Dairy Collective. And we have three cows. And uh, so we have some fresh milk this morning. So I thought I might add some of this here. So just a slush. And it comes with the with the cream as well floating in there. And I'll just get a fork and stir that up. So at this point, if you're wanting to add anything into the egg as well, say like some extra herbs, you know, if you have some basil or some sage, or rosemary, uh, thyme, or even something like um, some garlic chive flowers, you can kind of pop them in at this point. And that's a really nice thing to do. Or you could even slice up some, some chili, any sort of flavors, pepper or salt if you want to do that. But I'm just gonna leave it right, nice and natural. So that's it. So I'm just gonna wait and see um, if my vegetables are ready. And as soon as the pumpkin is soft, that's when I'm gonna pop this on. So let's go and have a look. Okay, so that's looking really great to start putting on my egg mixture. So I'm just gonna just make sure the pumpkin's all nicely distributed and then just gently pour on the eggy mixture all the way around like that. And then wait until we start to see that it's cooking around the edges and there's bubbles coming up in the middle. And then we sort of know that it's ready on the bottom and we can stick it in the oven. So now is a good time to make sure that your oven is at the right temperature and it's ready to be able to go straight in. So I tend to just put it in underneath a grill just to do that final cooktop. Now, I'm not gonna add uh, any cheese or anything on the top of this uh, today, but sometimes if I've got a nice cheese, I might mix that in, either, even a homemade cheese into that mixture or even just sprinkling some harder cheese on top. But that is just perfect, just as it is. So while we're waiting for the Canada to cook and for the egg to start to cook on the stovetop, we can get our tea ready. So we had some lemon myrtle leaves from the tree just outside my veranda there. And what you can do is just pop them straight into the pot, just like that fresh, and then pop some water on top. Now, alternatively, you could also just grab a couple of leaves and pop them into individual jars or glasses or cups, mugs, whatever you're using, and then have one for each person that has the leaf still in it. So the thing would be just to let these brew for a minute or two, and then uh, you can pour them out as well. So I'm gonna put those aside. So you can see it's ready now. The, the gases are sort of stuck, starting to come through the middle and it looks a bit cooked over here. So it's time now to um, turn off this one and uh, pop it into the oven. And while that's cooking, we can just take a check on what's going on in here with our, with our canner. And it's starting, oh look, that's nice and soft now. I can get my fork into that. And it's starting to go, you can see, slightly translucent in here. So that means we're almost done. So by the time the uh, frittata's cooked, that one's gonna be ready. So I'll just leave that cooking for a bit more. Beautiful. Okay, look at that. That is magnificent. So now it's just a matter of plating it up. So this is an easy pan to actually get food out of. So I'm just gonna scoop it up like that. And we are. So there's the frittata. Now all I'm gonna do now is grab some of the salad greens, pop them around the edge. And you can grab any kind of salad greens that you've got going on in your garden. So we've got Suriname spinach, um, Okinawan spinach, parsley. Uh, we can pop in some, uh, some garlic chives. So I might just actually chop them up a little bit. And sprinkle them all over. Now you can also, if you want to, add some chili. You've got some avocado, that would be really lovely. And uh, with the lime, simply just grab one. I often use this little juicer. And just a little bit of a lime, squirt it onto these greens. It's really, really lovely. There we go. 
And if you wanted to, you could also make a really nice lime bubble uh, drink to have with your meal. But we're going to have our lemon myrtle tea, which I think is ready now, so we can plunge that, grab a glass, and yeah. So we've got our, our, our frittata, a little bit of salad here on the edge, and I'm just going to go and get the can of that should be ready now too. And so the can is ready now. You can see it's gone slightly translucent. That means it's ready. So I'm just going to add that onto the side. And, uh, you know, if you wanted to, you can make mashed potatoes or you can just sprinkle a little bit of uh, salt on these if you want or pepper, anything that you'd normally put on your potatoes. And voila, a lovely lunch straight from the garden. Let's have a taste. Mm, that is delicious. So give yourself permission to be creative with your garden and your cooking and try using more of each plant. Experiment. Talk to other gardeners and people from different cultures. This is so much fun and it really helps us to be much more localized in the way that we grow food and reduce our ecological footprint and create a really in beautiful local food system. So I just wanted to point you to a few resources that you might find useful. Firstly is my blog, Our Permaculture Life. And you can see up the top there, um, ourpermaculturelife.com. So here you'll find access to about 400 different articles about all kinds of plants and um, garden tours. It's also a space where you can find uh, my podcast. So check out that and, and you can also I also encourage you to subscribe you can see the button up the top there um, when you subscribe to my um, blog you'll get a weekly newsletter which just simply has an update of the latest podcast the latest film and any events that are coming up that uh, are useful for you so check that out there I also have um, these free monthly online masterclasses and we're up to number 31 uh, 32 now so um, we have a whole series of these available for a little while longer now. I'm going to leave these available on my YouTube channel. So you can go to my YouTube channel, which is um, Our Permaculture Life. Search up that and you will see it in a playlist and you'll see all the masterclasses that are available. These are soon going to be going into a new membership program that I'm starting called The Permaculture Way. So if you're interested in having a look at these masterclasses, um, check those out now. I also have a weekly podcast called Sense Making in a Changing World. And I've been just had the honor of having conversations with the most amazing people. So you can find the link to that on the blog as well. Um, and also I have them both as audio, but as a video as well. So if you look up Sense Making in a Changing World uh, YouTube, you'll find all of these conversations and actually see a sim conversation if you prefer to watch that. So there's many people who are here today who are part of the Permaculture Educators Program, which is basically a permaculture teachers program. But within it is woven a permaculture design certificate course, um, the permaculture teacher certificate, and also some business modules. And we explore together um, designs and permaculture charity work, permaculture youth work, um, permaculture education in a whole range of different realms. So if you'd like to find out more about that, um, you can see the website there, permacultureeducationinstitute.org. And I'd, I'd love to um, welcome you into that program. Any of you who are here or part of it, feel free to, to type in the chat you know, that you're there and maybe someone might like to ask you some questions about it too. That would be great if you could chat with people about that. So thank you for listening and being part of this session today. I uh, just wanted to summarize some of the key uh, links and resources that I have available. So I just mentioned the Permaculture Education Institute. That's there. Um, you know, if you want to keep track of these links, you might want to take a screenshot possibly. So um, also our permaculture life, that's where you can find the blog, also the uh, the YouTube. So I have a YouTube that has probably about 200 films in it about permaculture, the podcast, which is we're up to about 30 conversations. And also I run the Incredible Edible Garden course, which is an introduction to permaculture gardening course. You can find all of that on Our Permaculture Life. Also, I run something called the Ethos Foundation, which is a permaculture education charity. 
And our main focus at the moment is really working with refugees in East Africa. And um, we've just formed a relationship now too with uh, the global organization Permaculture for Refugees. And a project I absolutely love is the Global Perma Youth. And this is a youth-led program led by many of the young people who are part of the Permaculture Educators Program. And they run festivals and uh, classes and conversations, just about to launch their own podcast. They have a YouTube channel, weekly meetups. And their goal is to link up young people, teenagers in particular, who are interested in looking at a new way forward and very much about that practivism, positive, practical permaculture activism for a future that they want to create. So that's that's a, a sort of a snapshot of all the kind of programs that we're involved in. And um, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to stick around now for another 10 minutes or so and very happy to chat with you uh, in the chat box there. Um, feel free to ask me any questions you like. And um, thank you again for being here. It's lovely to have your company from all around the world. It's absolutely fantastic. Take care, stay safe, and I'll see you all again next time.